stated as NPK, 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 NPK. What's the name? Carbon. Hi guys, it's Katya here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today's video is gonna be a long one. Grab some popcorn or some snacks, grab an empty notebook because you will probably want to take some notes. So today's topic is gonna be all about fertilizing. In the first part of the video, we're gonna go through a fertilizing, what it is, what kind of fertilizers do we use, what should you take into account when you're fertilizing. In the second part of the video, I'm gonna go through the products that I'm using in my care routine or products that I have at home and I have yet to try. A little disclaimer, I do have my laptop on my left side, so if you'll see me peeking there, it's because I have notes. It's a lot of information even for me, so. And now to begin, what is fertilizer? So fertilizer is any material that's organic or synthetic origin that is applied to the soil in order to provide the nutrients needed for the plant to grow healthy. So simply put, it is food for your plant. So the next question is, why do we fertilize. When the plant is growing, it is actively using those nutrients either to make new structures, make new leaves, new flowers, new all of that, new roots as well, and it does need nutrients for basic metabolism in the plant itself. It needs them to get energy, it needs them to photosynthesize. It's the same thing as with vitamins for us and nutrients for the plant. And if the plant starts to lack one or more nutrients, it will gradually go and turn into deficiency. So so usually the soil that you buy or you mix at home, if you do include some humus in there or like peat moss, it usually has enough nutrients for four weeks, sometimes less. It depends on the plant we're growing, how much nutrients does it need. And usually it is recommended that after that period, you start to fertilize it yourself. Now we're gonna go into type of fertilizer that we know. The first one is organic fertilizer. As the name suggests, it's derived from either plant or tissue materials. They're usually byproducts. The nutrients that they contain, they are not in accessible form to the plants. So the important note with organic fertilizer is that they need to be broken down by bacteria in order to get those nutrients available for plants to even use. Microbes will also break down the substances in like a relatively stable manner. It's gonna prevent the shock of, you know, fertilizer burn. It doesn't really happen with organic fertilizer just because it's a gradual release, not instant with inorganic fertilizers per se. So what organic fertilizer is, it's actually food for microbes. So whenever they break it down in order to get energy, they also release smaller particles, smaller compounds that can be absorbed by the plant and they will utilize it to its fullest potential. I focus in my growing as I want to provide a good and healthy media for bacteria to grow because they are so important, so important. I'm gonna touch on that a little later on. So usually if you have good food for the good bacteria, those will prevail and there's gonna be less chance for pathogenic bacteria to come and, you know, multiply. Organic fertilizers, so basically they're gonna keep your plant happy long term while also providing this good environment for the plant to grow in. And then the opposite of organic, we have inorganic fertilizers. It basically means that the nutrients, they're already in a state that's available to the plant so they can uptake it instantly. So you don't need any microbes to break it down, you just need to apply it to the plant and it's gonna uptake it if it's missing a nutrient, obviously. So when you are using inorganic fertilizer, and as I mentioned, they don't need to be breaking down, there is a higher chance of getting a chemical burn. So you should really read the labels. And usually it's fine if you go with a full strength, but I personally, even with organic ones, I go at lower strengths. It's more of a precaution. I feel like it's better to go lower dosages and more often and constantly instead of like, you know, one big shot. Inorganic fertilizers are mainly used in inorganic media, so such as pond, because pond doesn't really provide a good substrate for healthy bacteria or like good bacteria to breed and multiply. They are still there but in not as big quantities, there's not much food for them and if you are using the organic fertilizer in pond, it does tend to stink up just because the bacteria won't break it down. And the next section that we're gonna move is how can you fertilize your plant? The first option is by using a slow-release fertilizer. This is Osmicote and there's another coat 
So you get inorganic fertilizer that's packed in a little ball which has a protective shell and once that protective shell breaks the liquid and the fertilizer will release with it. I know for Osmicote it allegedly breaks with temperature but for some it does break with mm, water or sunlight and microbes as well. This type of fertilizers are great if you are forgetful of when you fertilize. I do use them in all my media just because the aeroid mix that they have doesn't really have any organic rich materials for microbes. I use bark and tree fern and all that and before that breaks down and microbes can use it, it takes a while. So I do use some of the Osmicote regularly in my... I actually mix it with the Aerid mix and if you're curious about my Aerid mix I did do a video on it so you can check it out. And then another option is foliar feeding. This, as the name suggests, you feed the plant by its foliage. So plants can absorb nutrients through the stomata or like the little pores in the leaves where they exchange gases and water and some other stuff as well. The most of them are on the bottom side of the leaves, so on the apexioles. So if you are using foliar feeding, be sure to spray the undersides of the leaves and it's really great because this way the plant can intake the nutrients really fast. If you per se fertilize the soil, first the nutrients need to move to the roots and then from roots they need to move to the main system of the plant and then get distributed to where they need to be. With foliar feeding, they're kind of just whoops in the leaves and then they get transported to whenever they need to be. So it's really good to use if you have any plants that are showing like severe deficiencies, it's the quickest fix you can do. And another note on foliar feeding, it's recommended to do it early in the morning just because the air is still cold. If it's too hot, the stomata will close and the uptake won't be really efficient. And and during the night the stomata also semi-closes, I believe. I have found that on fertilizers you can see you have like normal fertilizing, they're like foliar fertilizing and the concentrations needed for foliar fertilizing are much lower and I think it makes sense just because the intake is instant. And then we have the classic which I believe everyone uses, it's soil fertilizing. So it means is you get a water, you put some of your favorite fertilizer in it as instructions say or less and then you water your plant with it. Mm, what happens is the nutrients will then travel to the roots and then will get uptaken by the plant and it's interesting thing to note if there are less nutrients they're gonna be moved faster by diffusion as if there are a lot of nutrients because if it's a lot of nutrients the plant doesn't really have that much of a need to pull those nutrients super fast and diffusion doesn't work that way. So when we generally speak about nutrients we divide them in two categories macro and micronutrients as the name suggests, macronutrients are those that are needed in bigger quantities and are usually the limiting ones in terms of plants' growth and health and all of that. And those are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium... What's the name? Carbon, carbon and oxygen and... Hydrogen. There. Wow, I struggle with chemical names in English. And the micronutrients are those that are needed in lower quantities. The first and the most important nutrient that you should pay attention to is nitrogen. So if your plant has a deficiency, it is most likely like nitrogen. So nitrogen is important because it's needed to build up a new structure. So if the plant is growing a new leaf, it will use a lot of nitrogen. It's also essential part of the chlorophyll. The important thing with nitrogen is the soil cannot provide enough of nitrogen for it or in available form for the plants so the plants are really relying on it from outside sources whether it is microbial or whether you do foliar feeding it's usually released when the material is breaking down by microbes so once again we are back to microbes and how useful they are in the soil nitrogen deficiencies are really interesting because if the plant is growing in a leaf it will kill the older one and suck all the nitrogen out of it and transfer it to the new leaf so it can build and work up on that so usually you will see that type of pattern old leaf dying new leaf happening i think it's common with anthuriums at least i know my queens usually do that and i've kind of come to terms with it even though they are fertilized exactly the same as 
all of my other interiors. And this is one of the easier deficiencies to spot and also to solve. You just need to fertilize your plants more often and you can also put some release fertilizer or you can afford repeating if you want like instantly boost the plant. The next one is phosphorus. Phosphorus is a nutrient that's really important in blooming plants. So whenever the plants are reproducing, making berries, making seeds, all of that. It's also important for the energy because phosphorus is part of ATP, which is the energy molecule, which basically drives all the processes in plants. Deficiencies of phosphorus are kind of hard to spot and all of the other deficiencies as well, just because allegedly I found this on the internet so don't hold me accountable please the plants get like reddish slash purplish pigments but i've never really seen that happening i think with anthuriums it's easier to see if it's not fertilized enough it will just abort its inflow i think that's the easiest way to go about it or if you're pollinating an alocasia or monstera or whatever you're tinkering about you just keep that phosphor level high okay and then the last one is potassium. Potassium is also important for water movement and transportation of carbohydrates and nutrients. So it basically keeps the metabolism of the plant going, if you know what I mean. And those three nutrients, so nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus are also the ones that you would see stated as NPK, NPK, NPK. NPK, NPK value on the fertilizers. So it goes NPK 15, 10, 15. It means that there is 15 milligrams per 100 grams of nitrogen, 10 milligrams of phosphorus, and then it's 15 milligrams of potassium. The more you know. And now we're gonna move to another important role that affects the availability of nutrients in the soil and that is pH level of the soil. pH level actually means how acidic or alkaline your soil is and it's put into numbers based on concentrations of certain ions. So majority of the soils that we are using they are more on the acidic side. Usually it's 5 from 7 if you have some really acidic soils, they can be up four, which again is kind of low if you think about it. And as I mentioned before, pH levels dictate how available will be your nutrient to the plant. So the optimal pH for majority of nutrients to be available is around 6.5 to 6.8, which if you think about it is kind of high and the soils and the materials that are used tend to be more acidic than that. So we have moved to somewhere more acidic spectrum and if you look at the chart, you can see there's less nitrogen and less phosphorus available at like 5 and 5.5 and there's also magnesium is not as available. Can you really do much about it? You could buffer your soil to a certain pH. I've actually never measured it. I should. We do have a pH meter. I should definitely do that. Part one of the video done. So this is it for a guide about fertilizing and which products that I use. Hopefully it's been useful you've learned something new. I do really hope you've learned something new and in a manner that could explain some of these more challenging processes and all that for you and that you understood it. Like if, if that happened, good. Mission accomplished with this video. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. It would really help a girl out and hit that notification button and I'll see you next time. Bye!